Good. Well, thank you for coming tonight. This will be a fun, interactive. I have no handouts. As you can see, I have no PowerPoint. Um, I should give you my name. That might be important. So my name is Fred Hubler. I am a local guy. I ran the Chamber of Commerce. I currently am the president of PAX in, uh, in Phoenixville. I uh, was a VP of the Senior Center, so I, I, I believe in giving back, and this is part of that giving back. Um, my day job that actually you know, pays me is I run a wealth management office in Valley Forge. We're now in 15 states. We're not Vanguard, that's the other place in, Van in, in, uh, in Valley Forge. Um, and we work with, uh, with clients, and we solve a lot of problems that I want to at least keep you guys from solving, you know, having any other new problems. Um, one of the things I want to do in this investment 102, I just want to get a little deeper in, in how the world really works. A lot of the stuff we're going to talk about isn't common sense, isn't common practice. And the things that are true are not the things most people know. And so I'm here to kind of you know, answer any question that you have. Um, as I said, I'm not dressed to impress, I'm dressed, dressed to educate. Uh, any guesses on what 3671 is or 9599? There's no wrong answer. First time I heard about this, I didn't believe it, and it's true. So, if you were to think of how many stocks are in the stock market, how many individual companies, you would think and feel that probably is a big number. I mean, I don't think it's out of the question to think it's, you know, a lot of companies, McDonald's and, you know, JCPenney, all those companies, where actually in the U.S. market, this is the list of stocks with a ticker. This is how many companies that are out there that people can buy. And there would be IBM and Apple and, and you know, um, all the companies that are public. This is how many mutual funds there are, and all these mutual funds invest in that. So I had a client who had a very large uh, public, you know, very large portfolio. And I couldn't, I didn't want to insult him by thinking or by telling him he just had, you know, no matter how diversified he was, he, he was in the same things. And what I told him is, you have the same type of, you have the same investments more, we have the same investments as my eight year old twins could have. They won't have as much, but you're not, as, as someone with, in this case, you know, millions of dollars, he didn't have anything different. And so part of what um, I want to share with people as, as, I teach, as we talk about it is all of the different ways you can invest. We've all been trained to think a certain way. So this is uh, not Charlie Brown or anybody else. Uh, this is a portfolio that I want to have some, some audience you know, participation. What are some things, and we just talked about it, stocks are one of them. So what are some things you can invest in when you're talking about a portfolio or when people say, a portfolio. We've got stocks, and this is the audience participation part. What else can we have in a 401k or have in an IRA? Um, what other investments do people have typically? Property. Okay, so real estate. That's good. Yeah. Hi, come on in. Yeah. Don't worry. Uh -huh. I just gave all the good stock tips. You missed it all. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say? Bonds? Good. Have a seat. We're good. Please have a seat. Antiques and valuables like that. Okay. Oh, valuables. Now, a lot of times it's hard to put that in an IRA or a 401k, but the people definitely can do that. We're kind of splitting out what investments are. So we have stocks, we have real estate, we have bonds, we have valuables. Um, what else do you think? What else do you think of as, as an investment? Gold. Gold. So we'll call it commodities because that's, that's all the stuff out there. You just want to see if I can spell commodities. I think I did. All right. Commodities. So cash. Cash? Perfect. Cash. Cash is king is Don King's cousin. Cash. What else we got? Stocks. We have real estate. We have bonds. We have valuables. Commodities, cash, I mean, that's pretty much, that's a lot. And most people, when they're talking about a retirement portfolio, a lot of times they split it up to be, you know, a 60-40 portfolio 
is, is usually the, the middle of the road type of portfolio. And the thing that's important about that, and the numbers that you missed earlier, this is the number of public companies in the US market. Um, the Russell 2000 doesn't even have 2,000 companies in it. This is the amount of mutual funds um, that are investing in the same thing. So we have, as, a, as an economy, trillions of dollars all in the same thing. At the end of the day, the, the, all that money is funneling somehow into, they can only have, uh, a public company can only have one of, or you know, a mix of these less than 4,000 companies. And the first time I saw that number, I'm like, well, that has to be the NASDAQ market, or that, that can't be the New York Stock Exchange. That's actually every U.S. Exchange, so Nasdaq. Um, it's not talking the penny stocks. I'm not, you know, the people aren't going to be investing in that. Real people don't invest in penny stocks. This is more, you know, the tickers, the companies you know, the IBMs and everything else. So the interesting thing about this is there's a concept called modeling, and it's in everything that anyone ever does. So if you want to lose weight, you look at someone that had your body type and say, well, how do they do it? You want to buy real estate, you look at someone that was in real estate and ask and, and kind of. You can do that at work. You can do that in life. You, um, you know, someone has great kids. They write a book. You do what they did with their books, and chances are you're able to, you know, have a similar outcome. Well, investing is very similar in the fact that there are public ways you can see how the smartest kids in the class invest. So, if you had to guess, and I'll tell you who the smartest kids in the class are: Harvard, Yale, and the California Pension. Those three foundations, the Harvard Foundation, the Yale Foundation, um, the California you know, uh, Pension, California, you know, CalPERS, uh, County Foyer school, school Pension. If you had to figure out how they invested, if most of us are in some form of a 60-40, 60 stocks, 40 bonds, or as you get older, maybe you're 60 bonds, 40 stocks, but you're in a mix of these public companies, and you'll have bonds as well, if you had to guess how much of the, let's say, the, the, the foundation money, CalPERS, Harvard, and what I reason, the reason I'm picking them out is they have a, a very good track record of making very good returns. And they've been doing it all the time. So it's not like it's one, you know, once in a while they do a good job. Um, and they have to show in their annual report where they put the money. Now they don't do it ahead of time. They don't tell you what they're doing before they do it. But at the end of the year, they have to say, okay, here's what we did. How much of their money do you think is in the public market, if you had to guess? The same public market the rest of us are forced to put all of our money into. Because that's the only thing most people have in their IRAs or their 401ks. Everyone's 401k is mutual funds. Every mutual fund's gonna own, this is the mutual fund number, every mutual fund's gonna own a mix of those public stocks. So if you were, if you had to guess at how much CalPERS, on average, CalPERS and Harvard and uh, Yale has in the public market, what do you think that number would be? There's no wrong answer. 40%. 40%? Anyone go higher? Do you think? So they have 40% of their money in the public market. Where do you think they have the rest of their money? So stock is the public market. So, so you're saying they have 60 percent in, in stocks and yeah, bonds and yeah. 60. So, and, and do anyone go higher than that? Do you think they have more? If they're investing, they have a long-term time horizon. Uh, there are model of how investing should be done. They probably have more bonds. So they have, on average, 70 percent of their money not in the public market at all. So the smartest kids in the class aren't even going to the casino. They're not even on the boardwalk. And the rest of us are trying to figure out which number on black, you know, which number on the roulette table or whether the Cleopatra slot machine is going to be hot this year, whether it's growth or value or whether it's IBM or Apple or whether it's Google or, you know, we're all thinking about all these, you know, which of these are going to work, which of these public companies are going to work. Smartest kids, the, the foundations, um, they have on average 60 to 70% of their money in what's called alternative investments, in non-public investments. So they still have money in the stock market, but the rest of us are forced to do 
in the market, whether it's a bond market or, or the stock market, it's the public market. They have about 30%. And the difference between them and us is they can, when they buy a company, they have enough money. They have you know, billions of dollars under their management. They can buy enough of the stock to put someone on, their, on, their, on the board. And that's really where how Warren Buffett, and people say, well, Warren Buffett's a great stock jockey, or he's a great stock investor. He is because he buys enough to put someone that he trusts on the board to make the company do the things he thinks the company should do. Um, so he's not just buying a ticker and hoping it. So unfortunately, a lot of the things that we do now and a lot of the world that we're in now is um, not as transparent as what things are. You know, we only have, we have less than 4,000 companies and, and that's the total of all the types of companies. The people that we can see have great track records have 70% of their money not in the market at all. So we can say, okay, some of the stuff you guys already did, you have stock, they're in real estate, public bonds they're not in, valuables, you know, whether it's, it, now they're not buying, uh, you know, a uh, baseball card collection, but they're buying things that are not just in the market. Now the thing that, that these foundations have that we don't have, they never die and they never pay taxes. So if you can figure that out, I'll come work for you. We'll take over the world. It'll be awesome. Um, and because they never die, foundations never die, they can do things that we know make a lot of sense. They can buy land outside of San Francisco, wait 50 years to be have it be part of San Francisco. Hi, come on in. There's seats up here. Come on in. So part of what we want to talk about, and the reason this is Investment 102, is to get real about where they're going with the money, um, to talk about, you know, this is the lay of the land, this is how it is, are there lessons that individuals can know? Because the last thing I want to do is show you all the stuff they're doing that you can't do it. Um, you know, we could buy land outside of San Francisco, but none of us want to wait 50 years to get a return. And then, mm -hmm. you know, so they can do those types of things, but, but we're not going to do it. Um, so they have 70% of their money in non-public investments. So cash is not a bad thing. Commodities is still a public thing, you know, but what they do is if you if you take away commodities a Lot of foundations own farmland Now is farmland a commodity. I don't think so, but it hits the same Palette, you know flavor palette. It's something that people are going to need no matter what happens in the economy as long as it's a um, a Product that isn't strawberries and has like one month a year that they can you know grow there's some there's some uh, recession-resistant uh, produce that, that farmers have, and a lot of farmers need new machines to do the farming, and all they have as an asset is their land. So what a lot of places do, including the, the Harvard and Yales, they go to the farmer, they buy the land, and lease it back to the farmer. So the farmer gets you know, millions of dollars in the bank, has enough money to you know, get the new equipment, and he's still farming his land, except for he doesn't own his land, but the landowners don't want to be farmers, they're, they're leasing it to the farmer for rent. Does that make sense so far? So part of what I want to do is kind of share with you, so the, the endowments are out there, you can read about Harvard and Yale, and you need to know what's out there so that you're not as brainwashed to think that you have to be in the stock market. We're at a 14 year, almost 15 year bull market. Um, and that won't last another 14, 15 years. So the fact that we're talking now is a good time. Cash is not a bad place to put money. Um, and the reason being, Warren Buffett has another example. He has $42 billion in cash. He's waiting for things to be on sale. And he's not letting it burn a hole through his, his pockets. Uh, and part of what I do, and a part of what I think you need to know, is no one knows what to do with money. And, and so what I've done, uh, when I started this 18 years ago, I said, okay, how, what's the ethical and legal way I can cheat? Who can I look at? Whose paper can I, can I look at to know where we're going? Because we all know half of every financial you know, guy or girl that, that says what's going to happen, they're wrong half the time. So if you've been around long enough, all of them are going to be wrong at some point. If half are wrong half the time, eventually all of them are wrong 100%. Yeah. The foundations have money in the farmland or real estate or yeah, so real estate could be, prop to me, real estate's property. Farmland is also real estate. Farmland is different because it's not improved. It's not a condo, <clears throat> it's not multifamily. Um, so we want to separate that so you understand. Real 
is farmland under real estate? Yeah, it's, it's more like that than a stock. But farmland is your, you own the farm land and someone else is renting it from you to do whatever it is, whether it's cattle, a lot of times it's gonna be some sort of cash crop. Soybeans, tobacco, uh, hemp is starting to become uh, very popular. And I always like to follow the money and it's, it's sad when I'm not surprised anymore. But if you, if not you remember, but they're in World War II, um, the government went to farms and said, listen, can you please grow hemp? It can be rope, it can be fiber, it can be all these things that they needed in World War II. Um, and farmers did it because it, it's strong. I mean, you, you go Google what hemp can do. And, and you can't get high on hemp, so it's not a marijuana play. Um, it was just, the, it's, a renew, it's a reusable source. Um, paper used to be made with hemp, and you couldn't tell the difference. It would look just like regular paper. Um, enter the special interest group of the Timber Political Action Committee and they tagged on the marijuana is illegal law that hemp was part of it. Is it related? Yes, but you don't you don't smoke hemp. It's it's you know, and because of that, we have God knows how many trees we've killed to make paper when we could have used hemp the whole time. That's going on pretty much the way things are today. You can always figure out that someone somewhere at some point in time had clout, power, or money. To make things just, you just needed to twist a little bit. And then 30, 40, 50 years later, we're like, how did, how did we get here? Um, hopefully, uh, because information now is not, we have no lack of information. We're Google, we can Google, you know, you stay on, you have a hangnail on WebMD, eventually you're going to end up that you have cancer. Because you just, oh, I have that, oh, I have that, oh, my God, I have cancer. No, you just have a hangnail. So it's not so much the information isn't, it's, it's the knowledge of what to do with it. And one of the benefits, Again, there's a lot of downsides to social media and the internet, and there's, there's things there that we're not going to fix today. But I think one of the benefits is information starting to become more available to say, wait a minute, why can't we have hemp as paper? You know, and when you find out why we can't, I think people are now very, have a very short, you know, short fuse with allowing that kind of stuff to happen because it affects us in our pocketbooks and, and in the decisions we're making. So there's a lot out there, but we're looking at Harvard and CalPERS, and they have 70% of the money not in the stock market. And I do want to go over what that looks like. Not that you can do it, but just to know what's out there. Because part of what I want to do for making this Investment 102 is to kind of lift up the, you know, the carpet and show you where the wizard is behind the scenes. Because the Harvard and the Yale and the CalPERS they do okay, whether or, whether or not your 401k is doing okay. Um, and when you have a 15 to 16 year run up of the stock market, smart people are not putting new money in the market. I can tell you right now, I'm, I'm not letting anyone put any new money in the market. So where are they going? And one of the things you wanna look at um, is something called private equity. And look at from a, you need to know about it, not that you should invest in it. And that's really what this class is. This class, is, I have nothing to sell you. I have here, I have information from 18 years of looking how the rich get richer. And I want to have everyone know this. Um, and because I have nothing, there's no product to get into this stuff, it can be truly and, and exclusively educational. So if you have, if, um, so before I erase this, 36, 71 is the amount, total amount, of public companies you can buy. So IBM, the ones with tickers, in the US market. Down from a much bigger number, but between mergers, acquisitions, and bankruptcies, you know, that comes down there. That 95.99 is the amount of stock mutual funds investing in. So you've got almost 10,000 things investing in less than 4,000 things. So when the market goes a certain way, we're all in the same stuff. There's no more, you know, there's no more anti-correlation. And when something like a 9-11 happens, we don't have bonds aren't going to be the thing that goes up, but the stock goes down. If you looked at 9-11 the day of, it all went down. People, it, it just, it, the correlations that they're still teaching today, the correlations of stocks and bonds, and it, it, it doesn't work anymore. They haven't changed the textbooks, but reality says, hey, Back in the day where it was hard to buy a bond and hard to buy a stock and hard to get out of it, we can do it on our phone with five seconds. You can do it anywhere in the world. So the correlation 
used to be because things were hard to get out of, there was that safety net. Stocks are going down, I have to talk to my broker, I gotta you know, have him sell the bonds. By the time you do that, there's a lag, like, you know what, things are better now. Now you can do it instantly. So part of what we wanna talk about is where are they going? If 70% if of, of foundations have money that are not the public markets, we need to talk about where they're, where they're going with it. So interestingly enough, a little bit of trivia, trivia that you'll never have on Jeopardy. Talking about 401ks. What are the types of investments most people have in their 401k? It was that number I just erased up there. It's the public stock sometimes. Usually it's mutual funds because nobody wants you touching your money in your 401k buying an individual stock. The exception, ironically, is, you, is, is your own company. And think about it this way. If you're buying stock in your own company and your company does bad, you may lose your job and you have a lot of your own money in the company. Like, the one thing you're allowed to double down on is the last thing you should have because so much of your livelihood is already being kind of controlled by that one company. But that's neither here nor there. So before 401ks, companies had pensions. You know, uh, my kids will read about pensions. They're eight years old. They're not gonna have a pension. They're gonna read about pensions. In the pension world, prior to 1972, 73, when 401ks were, were enacted by Congress, how much stock were pensions allowed, how, what percentage of stock was a pension allowed to have? This is how I keep you guys up so you don't fall asleep. If you have from zero to 100, what percentage were pensions allowed to have in stock? By law. 20%. Okay. Anyone go higher, 25? So back in the day, pensions were allowed to have 0% in stock. The funny thing is, the only thing we have as, a, as an option in your 401k is 100% of stock. What's the difference? Well, they have to put stuff in your 401k that has a chance of growing more than the fees they're taking off your money. And if you have something, you know, so, and was allowing stocks in 401k a good idea? Absolutely. We have the last 30, 40, 50 years, you could have forgot you own GE and become a millionaire because of the overall market. Um, so I'm not saying it was a bad thing, but I'm, I'm saying you gotta look at you know, what happened here, and we were all, most of you guys, were told that you max out your 401k because you're gonna be in a lower tax bracket when you retire. That is not true. Probably wasn't true for your parents, will not be true for you, and absolutely not true for your children. And if we were farmers, and I was the IRS, if you were farmers, going back to farmland, and I was the IRS, and I said, I'm gonna give you a choice. I'm gonna let you pay taxes on the weight of your seed or pay taxes on the weight of your harvest. Which one would you rather pay taxes on? Seed. Anyone else? All right, I mean the seed is gonna be a little bit of seed. So enter the Kool-Aid we all drank. Mm -hmm. We get a tax deduction on the seed and we, we choose our tax advisor by how much they lower our taxes today. And every tax advisor off the record will do will say something different than on the record. On the record, they'll say, max out your 401k, because then that reduces your taxable income, and then you have less taxes this year. They're basically saying, take the, take the deduction on the seed, because we both know I might not be your tax guy when the harvest comes in, and you're gonna fire me if I don't give you less taxes today. So if you ask an accountant what you should do, and or, what they do, it will not be the same answer. Because they know, people being people, my tax guy told me to do a Roth and I didn't get a tax deduction, so I paid more taxes this year. But what a Roth does is allows you to take that seed, you don't get the deduction, but now the <coughs> harvest is tax free. So if you do have a 401k and you do have a Roth option, highly recommend you take that. Because you, that money will grow tax free and come out tax free versus the 401k money won't. Welcome, come on into the party. No, no, you're not out of bed. I'm out of bath, I, not my kid's bath, right? I didn't have to do bath today. Um, so one of the things I want to make sure we do, and did you give me a, you're lucky this is a dry erase. Yeah. It, <laughs> I'll use water on it when we're done. <laughs> All right. So looking at Harvard and Yale, so what, one of the things that is good is, is ownership. And I did this in another class. 
but we need to talk about where we are in the markets. We have a very long, very rich run in the stock market. 15-ish um, years, depending on when you start it, will not be another 15 years. In front of us is a correction and an election, one of which we know when it'll be, um, neither of which the market might not like the results depending on what happens. Um, so we have risk already in our portfolios, and one of the things I'm sharing with Mark, I don't have your email, I don't even have your name, I have a software uh, that I can send you a link to your email, so I can't, it's not like a link I can put up where everyone can get to it. You take a questionnaire and it gives you a risk. And one of the things that is sadly common sense isn't common practice. In the market, in the financial advice world, it is with a straight face acceptable for you to have a label on yourself as a, I'm an aggressive investor, I'm a conservative investor, I'm a growth and income investor. Like you get the label, hey, what kind of risk are you? And for whatever reason, and I know the reason, we'll tell you the reason, they allow you to say what kind of investor you are using words to describe numbers. Like at the end of the day, risk is how much down can you stomach? That's what risk is. And, and using a word to describe a number, the only reason they're doing it is it's CYA. Because you can say I'm conservative and your portfolio can be down 12. And I can, with a straight face, say, well, down 12% in a really bad market, that kind of is conservative. And you're like, all right, I guess I'm not conservative. You know, I guess I gave you the wrong label. Where the risk software that we have, you fill out, again, it's online. I don't need to know your business. You don't just have your name and email, so you get the report. But it is a score from 1 to 100. 100 is really risky. 1 is really not risky. That's important to know before a correction. And that's important to know before things happen in your portfolio. So that is, I don't need anything for you or from you for that, but you might want to know if you're a 92 or a 29. The second thing we'll do, and again, I'm in Valley Forge, you can Google me. Um, Mark's known me for 18 years, so that's why he has me come back. The other thing we can do, if you're interested, is see the risk in your portfolio. Now for that information, I do need to know what you're in, but I don't need to know account numbers, I don't need to know anything personal, but I need to know the ticker, and the percentage that you have of it. So whether it's 10,000 or 100,000, I don't need to know the numbers. I need to know do you have 10% of this. Um, that software will do so. And these are reports I'm giving you. So I'm not gonna, you know, this is my giving back. This is how I'm gonna get into heaven someday. Is by doing this for people that have, you know, that don't become clients or don't need to become clients. That second risk is, so if you're a 72, it's good to know, and your portfolio's a 92, now you know your portfolio is riskier than you are. The third part of the report that I'll give you, everything you're in has history. Everything you're in has proxy. Um, so if it's not the exact history of what you're in, there's something that looks just like what you're in or a ticker that has history that can be very similar with the investments you're in. And again, out of those mutual funds, everything has, you know, they've been around. There hasn't been a new, a new gadget made in the world in those investing. The reason I'm telling you this is the software tells you your, your risk, good to know. Your portfolio risk, good to know. The third part is where the rubber meets the road. Because everything has history, the report we can do, and it takes us maybe 10 minutes, so don't, don't feel bad for me that I'm doing all this reporting for free. This is important for people to know. It tells us, and will tell you, the best six months and the worst six months, the stuff you're already in has done. So instead of saying I'm a conservative investor or I'm an aggressive investor, you can call yourself anything you want. Here's what your stuff's in. And if you look at that six month period of let's say it's down 12% and up 13 or up 15, and you're comfortable with that range, great. Now's the time to know that range before it happens. So if you're in something that goes down 24% in six months, and you know that before the correction, you know, well now you have, go to your own guy, go to your 401k guy. This is not a prospecting tool for us. This is a tool for people to give them what they need to know because most people don't know the risk that's already in their portfolio. And the reason it's six months is there's a psychological concept called the recency bias. If every class you took with me was fun for you, you're gonna take the next class. If every class you took for me was watching paint dry, you're like, <laughs> you know what? I'm not, I'm not gonna, you know, next time I see Fred's name, I'm not gonna, I don't feel like, like there's that recency bias. Investing is no different. If you're doing really well in the market, you are gonna overweight that, that performance, saying, okay, I did really well yesterday, I'm gonna do really well today. 
even though it's not true. Your body, and this, we're human being, nothing about that. So the risk analysis, let Mark know if you're interested. I'll send you the report. Um, the first part, I don't need any personal information, just your email to tell you your score. If you want the report of what you're stuffed in, I need to know what your stuff is to tell you what, but it's all completely private, and that's why I don't, that's why I don't have a generic email for everyone to go into. Um, so we have 14, 15 years, and everything you're talking about is a future mar market correction. I don't think I'm the first person to bring that up to you. Um, hopefully I'm not the first person, and that, that's because it's 15-ish years since the last time we've had a correction. Corrections are typically every five to six years for 15 years. So it's almost like that big earthquake in California. We know it's coming because it's 150 years overdue, but it hasn't happened yet, and people are starting to feel like, well, maybe it won't happen this time. Markets correct is what they do. Now, a lot of what I want to share with you is the stuff that no one's going to tell you because you need, but you need to know about it. The stock market has been up for about 16 years. I'm going to use a different color. And that's, you know, 15, 16, you know, I'm not going to split hairs, 15, 16 years for stocks. Anyone want to take a guess? Fixed income, fancy word for saying bonds. Like, if we were in class 101, I'd have to say bonds, but now we're in class 102, it's more advanced, we have to say fixed income. How long do you think the bull market, the good market, the bull market for fixed income has been. If stocks have been up for the last 15, 16 years, anyone want to guess how long it's been? In, it's been good, by the way. I'm not saying it's been bad. It's been good. How long has it been good in the last for fixed income? There's no wrong answer. Uh, at least five years. Five years. Anyone want to go higher? Depending on what the interest rates are? 35 years. Not 35%. Look at me. Thinking interest rates. Sorry. 35 years. So, for the past 35 years, we've been in a cyclical lower interest rate market. So, we probably in third grade, we were taught interest rates go down, bonds go which way. Right? We were taught that. Does anyone know why that happens? We're going to, I'm going to take this down to 101, not from 102. Um, you're going to buy my bond. So let's pretend and uh, let's see how friend, how many friends you have. Do you want him to make money or lose money on buying the bond? Make money. I said you have a friend. Just one. She said she, she was thinking. <laughs> All right. So let's pretend that um, the year 2000 interest rates are at 5% and I am GE and I'm selling a 10 year bond. Now there's something very important about bonds that is not the way bond funds work. So we have individual bonds, like an individual stock. A bond fund owns a bunch of individual bonds. <clears throat> Hopefully it didn't lose any here. So what we're doing right here is an example for an individual bond. And an individual bond is something, if you can have access to it, you should think of doing it, because there's gonna be, a vert, there's gonna be an element of owning an individual bond that is unreplaceable in a bond fund. You can't do what we're about to do right now, you can't do in a bond fund. And it's important because things are gonna change when we talk about, it's been 35 years up. So we want you to make money. What's your first name? Mohan. Mohan, we're gonna have Mohan to make money. I'm GE. Hi, come on in. Thank you. Is it snowing out there or no, anything? No, it's not. I told you, Mark. <laughs> All right, so he's gonna make some money. He's going to buy a 10-year GE bond. I'm GE, here's my bond. And he's giving me $10,000. I'm giving him 5% for the next 10 years. When 10 years are over, I get my, back my bond, he gets back his $10,000. That's all a bond is, is I'm, be, I'm, borrowing, I'm borrowing money from the public, or you're the public, you're lending money to a company. Did I lose anybody yet? So it's, it's no different, well it is different than giving your kids money, because they'll actually pay me back. But um, it's like if you lend someone money, the reason it's 10 years is I don't have to worry about giving him back his money for 10 years. Okay? I'm paying him 5% every year. Now, let's say we said we wanted you to make money. So, if we want him to make money, which way do interest rates have to go? If we want him to make money, we want the bonds to go up, interest rates have to go down. Okay? 
So let's go to, and I'm making these numbers up, but let's say 2005, interest rates are now 3%, which means if you want to borrow money from GE, I'm going to give you the current interest rate of the market. So I'm going to give you, you give me the same $10,000, I'm giving you the same bond. His 10 years is starting in 2005, so he has, you know, he has a couple more years besides 2001, but instead of getting five, he's getting three. Make sense? So that's for 10,000. But if he wants to sell his bond that's making 5%, so you get $10,000, you get 3%, you might be able to entice him if you give him maybe $11,000. See what happened there? He's getting five and the whole rest of the world is getting whatever the interest rate is. And in this case, it's low. So in the last 35 years, this has happened, going from double digit returns down to where we are today. There are people here, I think the number was 52 years old. There are potentially investors who are 52 years old that have never lost a penny in a bond fund. <clears throat> and when people think what stocks risky, what's bonds safe. So we have decades of that recency bias I just talked about where how things work lately or how you think they work today. There is a decades old and in some cases lifetime body of knowledge people have investing in bonds where they are not they are not risky and they can prove it. I haven't lost any money in bonds for 35 years. Okay, And the reason has been interest rates have been going down and down and down. So as interest rates go down, the bond that you bought a year ago is now worth more because no one's getting that interest rate today. Does that make sense? So if we're concerned that the market's overvalued because it's had 15 to 16 years of an up market, my bigger concern is that we've had 35 years of an up market in the bond market and everybody owns bonds in a bond fund and that's that bond fund does not have that at the end of 10 years you get back your money there's none of that because you don't own a bond you own shares in a bond fund did i lose you yet so the canary and i do have good news but i need to let you know you know clint eastwood is alive and well to the good the bad the ugly of this course so fixed income everyone's talking about the potential market correction of the stock market, yes, it'll happen. I want you to be more concerned about or as concerned about the fixed income, the bond market. Because here's what happens. We're in a bond fund and bonds went down. Let's say bonds go down because interest rates start to go up. Not tomorrow, maybe not even next year, but eventually interest rates, they can't get much lower. So you look at your statement and for the first time in your life, your bond fund wiggled down. Bonds are safe. It went down. Now you have a decision as a long-term investor. Do you stay invested or do you, do you get out? And let's say you stay invested, but these two, they tap out. Or we're out, Jerry, from Seinfeld. We're out, Jerry. Your fund will go down even though you never sold because they have to sell bonds to get your, your cash. So when you call Vanguard and say, I want my money back, they have to go into the market and sell the thing you bought and they give it to you. So if Every one of us is in a bond fund, and you're a long-term, sophisticated, knowledgeable, you know, um, you don't let emotions drive you, you're a long-term investor, and you're gonna stay the course, and the rest of us get out of the bond fund, you're gonna lose your tail, big time. Because here's what's happening. If we're getting out, the, we're making the bond funds sell the bonds, they sell their better bonds first. The ones that are in the money, they're the first ones to go out the door. They don't want to lose money, so they're going to sell them the ones that make money. Eventually, they burn through that. And now, to keep these people happy, because you call you at your money buck, they can't tell you no, they're now selling the dirt. They're now selling everything that they have to do. And they're selling bonds in a world that if the interest rates are going up, that vehicle that we just had where he made money because interest rates went from five to three, it works perfectly the other way. Let's go back in time. 2001, or yeah, 2001, 5% CD for me. In this case, I'll do what she wanted me to do before. I'm gonna make you lose money. I'm just, let's say interest rates are now 
So now you have $10,000. You borrow money from me, I'm GE, you're getting 7%. No one's going to get you. No one's going to pay you anywhere near $10,000 on something that's given away 5%. So in order for you to sell it, you've got to knock your price down. $9,000, $8,800. You don't have to worry about it. The market will tell you what, what you're going to get. Like You don't have to figure out, hey, interest are up. I wonder what I should make my bond. No, you go into the ticker and it says, here's what your bond's worth today. It's calculated for you. If interest rates are higher than when you bought it, your bond's down. Because that's the price to get out of a bond that nobody wants when they can get a new one. It's almost like the new car. No one wants the old car if the new car is paying more. Make sense? So there are people today that have not lost a penny in the market. And if you're interested in the canary in the coal mine, Google Bill Gross, literally that was his name, G-R-O-S-S, -S. earlier in class, you know, called class, early in our meeting, we talked about modeling. You know, you want to, you, if you want to model, you find someone that did something that you want to try to do, and you look at how they did it. Bill Gross was the poster child for a fixed income manager. He won, like, for 25 years in a row, he was the manager, the best manager of all time. All he did was bonds. He ran a company called PIMCO Total Return. At the time when he was running it, it was the largest bond fund ever created, and he had the say of what to do. And he would buy bonds not just for the income, but for the appreciation. He would buy bonds from a company that maybe the company had a bad quarter, so the bond was down in value because no one was as sure about the company. So you would buy a bond that was less than what it would be worth, and if the company didn't fold, which is, you know, he didn't do junk bonds, but he did a really good job. At the end of the day, double-digit returns in bonds, which typically isn't supposed to happen. So. I'm talking to him as a canary in the coal mine, so I think you know where I'm leading. The thing that we just talked about where bond funds wiggled and you stayed invested and the rest of us got out happened about six years ago to his PIMCO fund. He got fired. And if we had to guess, what do we think the underlying investments in the fund, how much do you think they went down? Because you know they went down because this isn't a happy story. I will have happy stories, but this isn't a happy story. This is a guy who, because people got out, the fund went down even worse. But they got out because their statement was negative. So if you had to guess, what was the number of a bond fund that people said, I'm out, Jerry? What do you think? Single digit? Because again, bonds are safe. So the fund itself, the, the, the portfolio, the stuff in the fund, went down about 4%. Not a crazy number. Like, we're not talking. But then the phones start ringing and people say, Bill Gross lost money. I'm getting out. I'm getting out. I'm getting out. At one point, the fund itself went down 35%. You, as a long term investor that didn't want to get out, but the rest of us called and said, I want my money back, they have to figure out what the portfolio is worth. And if they sell good stuff to give you back your money, the portfolio doesn't have good stuff in it anymore eventually if it runs out. So what we're saying is the underlying investment, that individual bond that we just talked about, only went down 4%. The fund, double digit. This scenario will happen in everyone's 401k, in everyone's bond fund. The minute interest rates start to go up, bond funds start to go down, and people start to get out. The door to get out of it is a tiny, tiny window for all of us to try to run out. It's not going to be pretty. So what do you do about it? I promise you I'd have some good news. In your 401k, you want to look for, you will not have any bonds, individual bonds. I have never seen in 18 years, ever seen a 401k that lets you buy individual bonds. Now, if you're no longer working and your 401k can roll over into an IRA, this, that would be one in there, you know, one scenario is you take the 401k, you do a tax-free rollover into an IRA, and IRA allows you to do anything you want with it. So if you open up an IRA at E-Trade, I don't care where it is, you can then buy individual bonds if you wanted to. And that individual bond, as long as the company's alive, so in this case it was GE, as long as GE's there in 10 years, no matter what the bond, now, now our bond will still go up and down. His statement for the next 10 years is not a 10% for the rest of his life. It'll go down to 87. It'll go up to 12. 
you know, if interest rates keep do nothing but go down, it'll go down from ten thousand dollars, which is what he paid, down, down, down. Except for as it gets closer to ten years, it will be worth ten thousand dollars because that's how bonds work. So worst case is he has an ugly statement for nine years, eleven months, and on the month where it's ten years old, it's going to be worth ten thousand dollars because that's how it works. And the thing, the reason you buy the bond is for the income. He's getting 5%, no matter what it's worth. So it really doesn't matter what it's worth. Your bond fund, that 5% that number he's guaranteed, you're not guaranteed. So, in, so you have two things to do. You can get out of the, I only have bond funds as a choice, and that would mean you have a 401k that you're no longer part of the job, you know, you're, you're, it's a, your old 401k, you can roll over to an IRA and then, you know, look for some good bonds. You can do government bonds. Like, it doesn't matter what the bonds are, but as long as you have an individual bond, you'll have that protection we just talked about. Second thing is if you are in your 401k and you're still working and rolling it into an IRA isn't an option, you can do short duration. So you'll see it under short term or short duration. That mechanism that as interest rates go up, bonds go down, has an, a component that is age-based. The longer term of the bond, the more extreme that movement is. If you are in, in going into a bond fund that's short duration, you don't have that much money out long term, which means that the interest rates go up, your bonds aren't going to fluctuate that bad. All right? Make sense? All right, my last pressing thing, and then we're going to talk some good news. So remember 2008 afterwards, they could figure out how the dominoes fell. Like when it happened, we didn't know what was going on and then you know, Lehman's blowing up and everything's blowing up. Um, but afterwards, they were able to say, what the just happened and let's figure this out. And they were all dominoes and they were, almost every domino was meant with good intentions. There was a president that wanted everyone to be able to own a house. So things got a little bit freer for who can own a house. Mortgage companies wanted to have a mortgage. They didn't care that you couldn't pay for it, but you know, that's your problem. So all that happened. Now I'm going to ask you, because you don't, you know, sometimes you don't want to take the blue pill or the, or the green, you know, the blue or red pill from the matrix. Do you want to see a potential scenario that is on paper as possible? And I would say right now is plausible but not likely. And I, I hope it's not likely because it's the worst thing I've ever seen. It, but it is not. It is almost like those dominoes again. Do you want to see that, or you line up? Do you want to be fat, dumb, and happy, and not know, and be naive, and just not want to know? Because remember, you, once I give it to you, you can't, un, you know, you can't unlearn it. I don't want to scare you. I'm going to give it to you guys. Class 102. I figured. All right. So right now, talking about pensions. If you had to look at the most, which part of 2008 did people drop the ball the furthest? Eventually you have to get to the S&P and the Moody's, the people that were underwriting these companies. Because you would come to me and you'd say, listen, what is, uh, am I AAA? And if I say no, you would go to him, if, if I'm S&P, the ratings agency S&P, you would then go to him, he's moody, so like, I'll give you AAA. Fred won't do it, I'll do it. So in order to keep your business as mortgage company or whatever you are, I'm gonna give you a AAA. Because I know if I don't, you're gonna go over there and he's gonna give it to you, so I'm like, well, I'll make some money, I'll give it to you. So in 2008, those things happened, and the day after I gave you a AAA, you went bankrupt the very next day. You couldn't have been AAA in real life if you went bankrupt the very next day, and it wasn't one company. Most of the market, most of the mortgage market did this. Today they're great, tomorrow we're bankrupt. And the ratings company were the ones that gave the stamp of approval. So that's important to know. So pensions have been, if you have a pension, God bless you. Pensions have been looking for places to put money to get some sort of yield, because you are not dying like you're supposed to. Yeah. They have a lot of people out there that, oh my goodness, you're still here. So pensions have been one of the biggest purchasers of fixed income, 
And triple B is the lowest rating you can have and still legally be in a pension. So if you go to, from triple B to double B, a pension can't own you. Does that make sense? And again, these rules were there to protect you. This is an investment grade. This means this company is good enough that you can invest pension money into it. So it's meant to protect you. But if this company goes from triple B to double B, the pension isn't allowed to buy you. It isn't allowed to own you. For the right reason. Again, this is all for the right reasons. Did I lose anybody yet? All right. This is going to get fun. So GE, GM, Ford, and AT&T. These four companies are about a third, they're all double, triple B, they're about a third of the fixed income market. They're almost, you know, it's a lot, you know, to have four companies be that big of the market. These guys have been selling bonds to pensions, and they've been taking the money from the bonds and buying their stock. Because if you're a CEO of a company, you have one rule, make this price go up. That's really not, not take care of your people, not take care of your employees or your customers. You have one job and you're a fiduciary. You're hired. Make the price go up. So what you can do is you can sell bonds 2 or 3% cheap money. Pensions are going to gobble it up because they need something. They need something safe and your investment grades so they can safely own you. And then if you are a company and you're buying your own stock, where does the stock price go? Does it go up or down? The market's an auction. So if you limit supply because I'm buying my own shares, the price goes up. Trick question. If I have a 4% or 2% dividend, and a dividend is, in, is, is payments for owning the stock, and I buy my shares off the market, do I have as a company, do I have to pay myself my own dividend? No wrong. I mean, there's only you have 50 50 chance of being right or wrong. So we have, yeah, I, I, I bought stock, I bought my own stock off the market and a 2% dividend. Do I owe myself the 2%? No. If it's in my treasury, meaning I bought it off the market, I now only have to pay the 2% on what's out there. I just saved 2%. That's money I would have had to pay, but I bought it. So that's been happening for the past 15, 16 years. Companies have been borrowing money. Pensions have been buying it. I'm selling a bond as a company. And then the companies buy their stock and the stock price goes up. So everything is cyclical. Eventually, one of these companies are going to have a, a rough patch. AT&T is the biggest, by the way. It's the biggest debtor in the history of man. We have a pretty decent history. AT&T has more debt than any other company ever has in life. I'm not saying it's good or bad. Just let you know it's out there. So let's pretend, remember those rating agencies, the S&P and Moody's that dropped the ball in 2008? Let's pretend that they're on their ball this time. They're on the ball this time. And they, which company do you want to, we'll, we'll pick on AT&T. And I have nothing against AT&T. I don't want an AT&T lawyer to sue me. So let's say that because of whatever, you know, the market slows down, AT&T becomes a double B rated company, right? Can a pension own them anymore? They have to be triple yeah. B or higher. So what happens when the biggest buyer becomes the biggest seller? Nothing good. You have the, the, the pensions of the, around the world are going to have to sell the AT&T stock because the rating agencies just did their job. They say, you know what, I'm not missing the ball this time. So this is where the dot, so this is plausible, not likely right now. This scenario, so you can see how this could start to really unwind very quickly. Things slow down, well now Ford's not selling enough cars, oh they're double B. People aren't buying enough cars, not buying enough GM, they're double B. You know, whatever it is, like, you know, because your company's worth is your stock and your bonds, if the stock market goes down, your balance sheet as a public company goes down as well. So here's how this played out in Japan. Japan is 70% of the fixed income market, meaning the government of Japan, because no one else is buying, becomes the buyer of last resort. So they stick in and say, all right, we'll buy your bonds. We'll just, to stop this hemorrhaging of everything blowing up, they are now 70 to 80% of the fixed income in Japan. Now here's the part that scares me. 
and you can Google this, it's called a debt jubilee. Not likely, any wood, I'm going to knock on wood. Not likely, but here's where it gets interesting. There are white papers on this concept that I'm about to share with you. It is uh, kind of white papers that none of us will ever see. We can Google it. People that do research for the Fed, people that do very high level, strategic, you know, 25 year thinking. There's something called a debt jubilee, and this is exactly how it works. And part of me wonders if this was the game the whole time. Do you ever find it like when you go to the you go to the carnival, you know none of those games are set up for you to win. But sometimes you think things are set up outside of a carnival, and you find out even they weren't set up to win. So it's called a debt jubilee, and what happens is eventually that contagion of what we just talked about, you know, rating agencies now having to change and everything is blown up. Governments around the world step in and say, right, I'm going to buy this stuff because no one else is, and we need to stop bleeding. The debt du jubilee works like this. Governments around the world step in because they have to, and you can see why they would have to. I mean, you have to stop the bleed. And then they go into a door, and they close the door, and I'm America, you can be Russia, you can be Japan, you can be UK. And we get into the door, and it's like, I don't owe you, you don't owe him, you don't owe her, you don't owe anybody. We all write, write off our debt to everybody. There's white papers on this already. So that scares me, because I could see why people would want that to happen. And it wouldn't be America reneging on their debt. It would be a debt jubilee. Every country in the world saying, we have no more debt. I could see them wanting to, I mean, can, it's, there's not, it's almost like a James Bond, but it's more believable than a James Bond thing. Um, here's where it hurts us. It only bails out the government. It doesn't bail out the investors, which means your bonds are still going to be worth nothing. It means your stocks are really going to still going to, you know, so, is it possible? What I just explained is absolutely a horrible doomsday plot that is not necessarily having to do with aliens or zombie. I mean, this is all kind of there. Um, anything we can do about it? No. Do I think it's going to happen? No. And I don't think it's going to happen for a bunch of reasons, one of which there's nothing I can do for anybody, including my own kids, if it does. So let's talk about some happier stuff. But if I'm right, I want you to know, hey, that guy. 2019, he told me this thing was happening. Um, no one sees it anytime now. The thing that, that was weird is that there's white papers on it. Meaning there's, there's academics that are saying, hey, wait, if this all happens and this all happens, let's all just do a debt jubilee and we'll all get rid of all, each other's debt. That might have an upside, but it'll be a very ugly upside. Does that make sense? So we got to deal with what we have to deal with. Um, so if, if stocks are not bad, and stocks are not bad, what are the foundations and the Harvard and Yale and they're doing? They're doing private equity. So whenever you think of private equity, almost one or two of you in the room think of Mitt Romney. Because he was in private equity. The thing I want to add to you is think of Pretty Woman, Richard Gere. That was private equity. He would buy a company and split it in pieces and sell the pieces. Um, so what do you want to look at from where to put new money? So this is the question. If you had a dollar, get ten dollars, where do you put new money? And this is a way of looking at it that I think will be a good way of looking at it for the next four or five years. Because it will kind of steer your decision. Holding and hoping is not a strategy. <clears throat> so buying Apple and just hoping the next Apple phone is a good phone is not a strategy. So what you want to look at is, is the thing you're investing in have a mechanism to do some sort of value add? So what would be an example of that? Private equity is, a, is an example of that. So that is a company, private equity company, will not buy another company unless they know ahead of time what they're going to do to turn it around. So remember Twinkie, Tasty Cake, yeah, the, the Twinkie people? So before Twinkie went bankrupt, 30 cents of every Twinkie went to pay people that retired from the Twinkie company. They weren't working there anymore. They were getting 30 cents of every new Twinkie. Now Twinkies are like two bucks. So we're talking a very hefty amount of Twinkie money wasn't going to the current people making Twinkies. It was going to the people that retired. Now, I'm not here to talk about unions. I'm not here to talk about what's good and bad. I'm here to talk about math. At one point, you could buy a Twinkie, pay a dollar, and most of that money went to the people that made that Twinkie. Fast forward, paying two dollars, a lot of that money isn't going to the people that made it. 
So it's going to retire people. Do they deserve it? I'm sure they think they did. I'm sure, I'm sure they did. However, Twinkie went bankrupt because whether you deserve it or not, if you can't afford it, you can't afford it. So a private equity company goes in, buys Twinkie out of bankruptcy. They didn't forget how to make a Twinkie. They didn't forget who knew how to make a Twinkie. They just said, listen, you want your job back? You can have it back. Here's what we're going to pay, but there's no union. We're, not, we're, the, we're bankrupt. We busted the union. We busted the pensions. You know, you got your pension for as long as we were around, and now that it's bankrupt, we're coming back out. Those things happen all the time, and they happen with private companies, they happen with public companies, but the idea is a private equity company will not buy another company unless before they buy it, they know what they're going to do to add value. Now, the Twinkie is a simple example, but it's almost like the HGTV flipped this house. We're not buying this house unless we know what we're going to do with the kitchen and bedroom or bathroom to make it look like a better house. So we have value add in stocks. It's called private equity. And you can Google this stuff. There's ways that you can get access to it. I'm not here to sell you any of it. I'm just showing you this is where they're going with the 70%. Um, so a proxy for a bond. If we were on Jeopardy and we were, the question was, what is safer, a bond or a note? What do you think people would say? From a, if all else being equal, is a bond safer than a note? Now, a note, I could have a piece of paper saying, I owe you 20 bucks, and that's a note. We know bonds typically have, you know, big books, and they have, you know, a lot of prospectus uh, literature behind it. So it would not be, you would not be completely wrong if you guessed that a bond is safer than a note. Um, you would not be wrong in thinking that. You would be wrong in saying that, because that is not true. <laughs> Going back to when GM went bankrupt, shareholders got, anyone remember what you got for your GE stock? Zero. Bonds. So if you had a $10, $10 bond, you got, 20, you got $2. 20 cents on the dollars. And a little bit of stock, which is not worth a whole lot. Right. So you, it sounds like you lived it. Yeah, so there is something. And once you understand <coughs> these things are out there, you need to have your, your, your eyes open. So there is something called a senior secured note. So this is um, capital <coughs> structure and let's say riskiness. Stocks are risky because you can get zero back on it. And bonds are up here. Senior secured note. Senior, does that mean anyone's ahead of us? When you were a senior in school, was there any yeah. grade ahead of you? Yeah. No. Senior means I'm at the front of the buffet. Secured. You want $100 million? Show me something worth $100 million I'm going to take. Rich people get rich because they don't lose. It's not because they don't take risks they don't need to take. And if you want $100 million from someone who has $100 million, rest assured they're going to ask <coughs> for it to be kind of like that carnival game but in their favor. Senior means I'm at the front of the buffet line. Secure means I get to take something from you if you don't pay me. And note, instead of a bond, note means the interest rate will float as the interest rate floats in the real world. So in that example where the interest rates went from three to five, interest rates go down, bonds go up, or in this case, let's say it went from five to three, interest rates go up, so the value went down. If you're a note and interest rates go from five to three, your note's the same price. There's none of that function. So let's take GE for uh, GM as an example. Senior secured note. Now, these aren't things that most people got into back in the day. These are um, sovereign wealth funds. These are institutions. These are Harvard and Yale. Like people with lots of money can give GE or GM a you know, $50 million purchase. But what do they have to kind of pony up as their assets? They have property, plant, and equipment. Right, your, G, your GM, your property, plant, and equipment. You go bankrupt. You come out of bankruptcy. What do you need to stay GM? Property, plant, and equipment. So not only as a senior secured note, not only did you pay me, because I lent you the money, not only did I get your assets when you couldn't pay me, you came out of bankrupt, I sold the assets back to you. I made it on both sides. I made it. So bondholders got 80% loss. Stockholders got 100% loss. Senior secured notes? It's not a no loss. Because you need a property. I got your property, but I, no. frankly, they don't need it. They don't want it. There it is. 
So there's ways if you do, um, if you look up senior secured notes today, there are funds that give you access to those things. And they're important because they don't have that interest rate going up, bonds go down function, because they're notes. And the notes are based on interest rates, the current interest rates. They're not a bond. So a note between you and I might not be as safe. Senior secured notes, it's the highest thing in the structure. Make sense? Yeah. So, so, so no matter what the market does, it is what it is, it's there. And the best thing with notes, again, if you're going to have $100 million, you're going to be rich, you're going to write the rules to keep you rich, frankly. The most notes, especially the good notes, have what's called covenants. They'll say something like, okay, by the way, you're like, you're, let's say you have 20% debt. If at any point your debt goes to 25%, my note's callable. I'm going to call my money back. So not only did you borrow money from me, not only am I first in line, I'm senior, not only is it secure because I have an asset, not only is it a note so interest rates don't screw me up, if you start borrowing money from someone else, I'm going to make you pay me back because I'm out. Because if you're borrowing money from someone else, mean might mean you're not making the right decisions and you have to pay me when I get out. So I think all of us have a little voice in our head that think the rich get richer because they know things that other people don't. I can, um, we'll have to edit this, I can tell you not only is that true, but it's a government program. Um, and what I mean by that is, has anyone ever heard of an accredited investment? Okay, you're not alone. It is illegal to talk about accredited investments to the population if they're not accredited investors. I got nothing to sell you, so I'm not breaking any rules. So a, an accredited investment is a certain subset of investments that licensed professionals have access to, not all of them, but most the good ones do, and they can't talk to you about it unless you're already a client and they understand your net worth. Now, again, everything's kind of done with good intentions. It is so, it, they're not very liquid. In a lot of cases, they're not liquid at all. But if you Google on credit investments, you're going to find that there's, there's a part of the menu, it's almost like when you order something from Starbucks that isn't on the menu, but it's like the special, this is in real life. Um, senior secured notes, those things are, are accredited investments. Um, and the more people that know about them, the more likely you know, this will get out there and you guys can, can learn from this. Because if the smartest kids in the class have 70% of their money not in the stock or bond market, you might want to look. And, and you can look at Harvard and Yale's annual report. That's my secret sauce. I study the annual report and see what they're doing. They're buying storage. You want to make some money? Storage. We're seeing it in Phoenixville. And what a lot of people are doing is they look at um, apartments and apartment permits being approved and realize Americans like to, their stuff. Right? True. Americans like to crap. So if they're going into an apartment and they can't fit all the crap, they go buy storage for their stuff. And storage is easy because if you don't pay, your stuff, I, take your stuff. I take your stuff. And I rent your, I rent your room to her. And I don't have to worry about you saying your toilet's clogged up and the roof's leaking. I don't. And now with apps, I don't even need to have a person let you in. The app knows who you are. Did you pay? Yeah, here's your code. Here's your stuff. You didn't pay? Yeah, all right, we're going to sell it. So storage is one place. So again, going back to the value add, there's value add in, in, in the stock market, and that would be private equity. Those companies don't buy things unless there's private equity. There's value add in real estate. So there are companies out there today that are like those uh, the property twins on HGTV, but they do it as a real business. And the, the one that I know of, they are the third largest purchaser of granite and stainless steel GE equipment behind Lowe's and Home Depot. Because every kitchen they do looks the same. They have a team of people. So what they do is they buy what's called B and C level, like ABC. A is the best type of you know multifamily apartments. Uh, C you know, we probably don't have any, maybe there's like C pluses in, in the shadier parts of Phoenixville, but they're not, they're not dives, they're just C pluses. Most is, you know, C plus B. So what these companies do is they buy a C plus or a B and make it, you know, a C plus into a, an A plus. Um, and all they do is they fix the kitchen and the bathrooms. That's where people want to see their money, that's where you're, I mean, you don't, when you visit someone else, they don't normally, hey, come and see my bedroom. They're in the bathroom, you're in the kitchens and the, and the bathrooms. Um, 
So there are companies out there that when they buy real estate, they don't buy something unless they have a value add component. So if you're going to put new money somewhere, hoping and holding is not necessarily where you want to be. I'd rather you sit in in cash until you find whether it's a mutual fund that has a, you know, they do turnarounds or they only buy companies that are undervalued and here's what we do to help them make value. Uh, the holding and hoping isn't going to work and if you're late and you're not invested in the next, say, six, nine months and the correction happens, you're up the amount of money you didn't lose. That's the whole, if, you just, if you just don't lose, you're going to be up. So it doesn't feel, don't feel like you have to run into this stuff, but you want to look at where Harvard and Yale are putting their money, storage, private equity. Um, they can buy land, like I said, they can buy land outside of San Francisco and wait 50 years for it to become San Francisco. None of us have the time to wait for that, but you can have exposure to storage. There's companies out there that, that are mutual funds and they do storage, but you want to look at what is the thing they're doing with their money, with your money, is that going to create value even if the market's flat or negative? So if there's a recession and I'm taking a C-plus apartment building and making it into a B-plus, I'm adding value outside of what's going on in the world. You know, I might not be able to get as much rent as I used to be able to get when I thought I was going to, but I'm still going to get more than I would have if I stayed a C-plus. Does that make sense? I'm throwing a lot at you. All right. So, um, Takeaways. I want to make sure you guys get some things out there. The um, Roth versus traditional, this is the, the seed versus the harvest. If you can do a Roth or a Roth option on your 401k, as long as you don't die less than 10 years from now, because the money you would have, the money has to grow fast. The money you didn't, the money you paid Uncle Sam in taxes, because you're going to owe taxes when you do a Roth, because you don't get the deduction, that money has to have time to catch up for itself. Meaning you might have $4,000 less dollars today because you did the Roth and you didn't get the deduction. Your Roth has to have that much time to grow and get back the $4,000 you would have had. And then be in, you know. So there's a, there's a pivot point that's usually seven-ish years. So if you know when you're going to die, you can have a perfect estate plan. You can figure out how to spend the last dime on the last day. Um, RMD. So, good conversation and this is fun to have. If I had a glass of well, I do. And I'm gonna. So if I ask you to boil this and make steam, and I ask you to freeze it, you would look at each other, look at me, and say, "Pick one, right?" If you're if you're gonna boil this water, and let's pretend like it's in a glass bowl, so you can boil it and you can freeze it. With a straight face, when it comes to investing, people will say, "Here's my retirement nest egg. I want it to grow. I need it to be liquid. I need income from it." and it can't go down. What you just described are four different states of water. The thing that will not go down won't grow. The thing that will grow won't be, you know, won't just go up, it'll go up and down. So what you have to do, and this has to do with income, your RMD question, you need to triage your portfolio by what it's going to do for you. So one of the things that, that we look at is having Figuring out what you need for lifestyle. Because retirement, and I know I'm, gonna, I'm giving you extra free time since it was free. Retirement is a man-made concept. In, in nature, there's no retirement. And if you, again, following the money, we talked about this with the whole, the hemp and the, the timber, you know, political act. So in the Industrial Revolution times, retirement was created to get the 30 and 40 year olds, the old guys, off the assembly line so the 14, 15, and 16 year olds could do your job faster than you. So in order to get you off the assembly line, they gave you the carrot. If you're gonna retire at 30 or 40 or whatever, you know, because we got someone 12, 13, 14 gonna take your job, gonna do it faster, <clears throat> and we get to do it cheaper because they don't want as much money as you. So retirement came in, and that was, so security came in shortly after, uh, pensions came in shortly, it was the carrot to get you off, get you off the field. So we can have someone do it cheaper, and probably do it faster because they're younger. Now that doesn't happen that extreme anymore, but retirement's still that artificial line in the sand. And if you replace re retirement with lifestyle income, now you're thinking the way wealthy people think. If you have enough lifestyle income coming that you don't have to work for, whether you call it retirement or not, you're kind of set. If you need $10,000 a month and you have something kicking off $10,000 a month that you didn't have to work for, 
because you invested in storage or you invested in any of those other things, whether you call it retirement or not, you get into the same place. But retirement almost says you're done working, which isn't true. You, um, you, you're converting your, ma your, your retirement nest egg now has to have, be in the same thing, by the way. You're still in the stocks and bonds you were in before, but now you're expecting a completely crazy expectation of this money. The market was up and down the whole time you were funding, you were funding it. But now that you're retired, you expect the market not to go down. It ain't going to happen. And so what you need to do is triage and figure out, okay, how much, how much do I need in income? And then find the investments that do that as a primary. So that's going to be some dirty words. Annuities do income. I don't care if you get an annuity, but it's what they're built for. They're built for income. Are they liquid? Oh, no. Are they cheap? Oh, no. Do they grow? Sometimes. Do they go down? It doesn't matter. It's income. The income will. So you, you earmark your dollars for what you want it to do. And you don't think of your portfolio as one bowl of water. It's a tapestry. You're okay, this money is going to be income. This money is going to be liquid. It's going to be the reserve. It's going to be the oh crap account. It's going to be the I forgot. I needed this. And it's going to be in cash, whether it's in cash under your mattress or in the bank. Um, so the few places that you have it, or the few ways that you want to think about it, you got income, you got reserve, which is just cash on hand, you have growth. And hopefully that means you have money that you don't need right away so you can wait for it to do what it needs to do. So this growth money, you don't expect it to be liquid. You don't expect it to go up. You, you don't expect it to just go up. You're giving it time to do its thing. But you also have to give this at least seven years in the market. Because if not, you have a chance of going into it right before 2008, then you're out of it in 2009 and you miss it when it came back. If you, if you had a coma in 2008 and woke up in 2010, you made money. Because in 2008, you're down 30-ish percent. 2009, you're up 27. 2010, you're up another 20-ish. So if you just forgot you were in the market or you had a coma or you fell asleep for three years, you didn't lose any money. Everyone who lived through that did not stay invested. They got out. And if you're on the vine that goes down 10% and you get off that vine, you're not going to get your 10% back. You've got to be on the same thing that went down, whether it's the same investment, but you have to be, the thing that went down that much, you have to be exposed to on the way up. Don't so really have to be in the same stock, that's not what I'm saying. And then where you can, income, reserve, growth, and when you can. So this is getting back to 70% of their money is not in the public market. What's it in? If you know antiques, as an example, that's an investment. So if you know antiques, if you know that there's things that, that are being sold that are less, that are more valuable than how they're selling, whether it's baseball collection, this, so this is alternatives. It doesn't have to be alternatives where you're a credit investor and you're getting into private equity. I'm just saying there's other ways to get a return. And there's a ton of places that will do this with our IRA money. So I have, uh, I have seen, they're called syndications. Again, you have to Google this stuff out there. Um, there are business owners that say, okay, I want to convert the Kmart in Phoenixville to something else, and I don't have all the money to do it. I'm going to open up you know, and buy and sell shares. I'm not doing this, by the way, so it's not me. You could use a custodian that is an IRA and use IRA money to do those types of investments. Are they liquid? Oh, no. They're not liquid because you're going to not get your money back until that becomes something else. Are they risky? Yes. But is it as risky as putting a new dollar in something that's had a 16-year run? I'd have to say probably not as risky as that because at least real estate can't go to zero. So open up, and the real thing I want to take away is open up your thoughts to more than what everyone else is doing because where everyone else is, has been long played. Stock market's been up 16 years. Bond market's been up over 32. Though nothing lasts forever, we have a correction and an election in front of us, and either of those might end up being something that spooks the market. If we have a socialist as a president, and now health care is free for everyone, but taxes are 98%, the market's probably not going to like that. I'm not going to be political here, but I'm just going to say, speaking of how I know how the market works, a lot of people are like, you know what? I'm not, you know, we're not doing that. So. A um, few things. My website I made public 
all of our videos and all of our research and a lot of calculators, you don't need an advisor to do the stuff you already are doing. So ccwmg.com, catcatwilliammarygreg.com. Go to resources. You don't have to log in. I'll never know you're even there. Um, there's calculators, how much you need to save. Um, there's articles on a lot of what we talked about, and there's simple articles. I retired in 2018 from the NFL Players Association. For 10 years, if you Google, still true today, but for 10 years, um, if you Google best NFL financial advisor, you organically got me. I'm a kid out of Valley, you know, I, I have an office in Valley Forge. Um, I like to think I'm like the rock, but I have better hair and I'm a third the size. If I can explain these things to football players, you guys, you can get it as well. Um, so, I gave you extra time, but I also want to leave time for questions. I threw a lot at you, so we had a doomsday scenario, um, shared with you what people, so we only scratched the surface, so hopefully this is enough to have you Google some of the stuff we talked about and, and look at maybe putting it all in stocks and bonds that everyone else is doing might not be the only thing you should do. Definitely should be part of it. Um, what other questions you have? My time is yours. I already got out of trash and bath night for the twins, so I'm, I'm good. I'm going to grab something to drink while you guys are. What questions do you have? I can go deeper in any of the topics we talked about. Oh, I have a question. Sure. Since I came in late. So with Vanguard, let's say mutual funds, S&P 500, is that something you're advising to separate? So um, it's that both have been very good for a lot of people for very long. Yeah. So on the bond, no, in, in most cases, you're there, you don't want to be a financial advisor. I'm not saying you need to start picking stocks. Um, so you can start to say, okay, on the stock side, you could pick funds that are more recession resistant. So high dividend paying, uh, what's called recession, and there's you know, you can go, what's this recession resistant fund at Vanguard, you'll get answers. So again, you don't need me to tell you, you don't need me for the answer, you need me to tell you the questions you want to be Googling. Right. Um, on the bond side, and you can do this at Vanguard, I love Vanguard, we have millions at Vanguard. Um, on the bond side, you want to do short, short duration. Uh -huh. Because the short duration doesn't have that same interest rates are going up and my bonds are going down. It, it's, not, it's not that extreme when it's a short duration. Make sense? Yes. Yes. Good question. You had mentioned um, the accredited investment. Yes. And that it's rather secretive. You have to have a particular net worth before. So the end, individuals, two, 250 of income as an individual, 350 as a couple, um, and typically million dollars of net worth, not counting your residence. Now, doesn't mean everything we talked about, you can Google, you can still find other ways of getting into it, but from a regulated, that that is the numbers. So if you're working with an advisor and you have those numbers, and you still don't know what an accredited investor is, then you're accredited and they're not, meaning they don't have the access to it. There's a lot of, um, I spent two years in a brokerage firm. I opened the office in Kimberton. Uh, it's a firm you know, it's a good firm. They never would offer accredited investments because um, their job is stocks and bonds and mutual funds. And so I realized that it was uh, not a fair, once I found out that these existed, I'm like, well, that's not fair. I'm in Vanguard's backyard. I'm never gonna be cheaper, never gonna be bigger. And I can't just sell the same thing they're selling and expect to make a difference. Um, so I lasted at the brokerage firm for two years. So I'm 18 into it. So 16 years ago, I went independent just so I could be where Vanguard was. Because I was never going to compete with that. Um, but there's other places out there that do it. And if you just know that they exist, it kind of is almost like having a, a password at a restaurant. Oh, you want the, you know, Singapore noodle. That's what we have here, you know. Um, and it starts the conversation, it opens up your eyes, okay, I'm pretty sure, you probably think this, you're probably sure Mitt Romney probably doesn't have all his money in mutual funds. Whether it's at Vanguard or Fidelity, it doesn't matter. Well, why not? Where, where are they? You know, how did he make all of his money in private equity? You know, they bought the, those types of investments, bought the, the Twinkie company, you know, and, and they turned them around. Or they'll buy a company and break it apart and sell patents to someone that wants the patents sell the real estate to make storage. I mean, you know, these things, the, the really good ideas have simple stories behind them because that's what actually happens in life. Um, most of the Wawa's we see back in the day, probably 2005, 2006, a lot of the ones that were being built at the time, Wawa didn't own. 
they bought the land, they made it a super Wawa, put it in the gas tanks, and then sold it to a trust that then leased it back. Because Wawa's money isn't in <clears throat> owning the real estate, it's in tying that corner up and going down three more blocks and tying up the next corner. And so that's, you need to you know, follow the money, that's where you need to, because that's what actually, that's what creates wealth, is where, what's really going on. And most of the market, most of the investors out there, most of the invest financial advisors are happy with the status quo because it's benefiting them. But if, if you know, at the end of the day, if the smartest kids in the class are doing something else, my my intent with this class is to start to Google, you know, Harvard annual report, see what they're investing in. You know, I say, oh wow, I can do that. I can look and see. Shoot, you're saying that because they are the best in the class, what they are doing must be the right thing. So they have a track record. That is record. atypical to a retail investor. But you, you think about S and P 500 for example. Right. They have a track record of 10% uh, per year. Uh, sure. And it does. But what's the track record of uh, private equity funds? So the track record I'm talking about is the Harvard and Yale. What is their track record? So they're double digits, and they didn't go down as much as in, in 2008. And then published. So we don't yeah, see. They're all public. They're all all the time. I yep, hear the S and P yep. returns every day. So the annual report for Harvard and Yale is, is public knowledge. Google it, they have a whole website based on it. And it's a proxy for how wealthy people are investing. Now, like I said, they don't die as a foundation, they don't pay taxes, so that's not, you can't do exactly what they're doing, but look at their annual report, you'll see where they're invested, you'll see that 70% of their money is not in the stock market. Now, they're short of that, not going to uh, like this S&P, I was saying, I can, uh, any day paper you open, you can yep. see that. Yeah. Or any time you Google or say you need sure. to see. And when the market you crashes, see. you'll see that in real time too. Yeah. yeah. So, but yeah, for so many years it has not been. Right, right. Yes. Every time you said president changes, then there is a risk, you know. Mm -hmm. But in the last three elections, every time Obama came and then the second time he came and then Trump came and nothing happened to the market. Right. And each time it went up. Yeah, it's been a, a new president. So now 16 year right. So with the new president didn't make a difference. Now election comes, you, you shouldn't be afraid that the election is coming there, so it's good to sure. down. Right? It's not so much that it's the election, it's the corrections happen every two to four years, and it's been 16. So if you look at the historical corrections, it, not since 1929 did things run as fast and as hard as they run now. I'm a numbers guy, so if, if a correction happened yesterday, I would be the most aggressive investor the day after. I'm, I'm looking at it saying, okay, what's the chances that this is going to run another 16 years? Chances that could happen. What's more likely is it won't as a straight line. So where are, and, and the other part is, where can we get double digit growth when what we've been in has done so well for so long that it would be naive to think it's going to keep going. And, and a lot of what we're doing is consumerism. You know, the. 70% of the, I keep using 70, 70% of the GDP of our country is on what you guys are buying. If you slow down, everything is going to get screwed up because we are supporting Apple and Amazon. Um, you know, you're writing a check to Comcast and Verizon. That's all, you know, that money gets, in a good way, duplicated. Now you have, you know, the guy that works for Verizon got paid because you paid your bill. Now he goes to Burger King. It's just all interrelated. Um, so from a stock market standpoint, we're not overweight in stock market only because of how much. And, and Warren Buffett is, again, another role model. All this is modeling. None of this is me guessing. I'm looking at what people I think have a track record of making the right decisions more often than not. Warren Buffett's sitting on $42 billion in cash. He could buy anything. He's waiting. So you know, that, that, that all weighs into, okay. What's he waiting for? I don't know. He probably doesn't know. He just knows no, that for things. Billion, he maybe have in cash. Hmm? But uh, as a percentage, or maybe have in cash. I'd have to, but it's, it's, it's the most he's ever had in cash his entire investing career. So, this so these outliers, to me, are selling a story. If the smartest investor has more cash than he's ever done in his entire career, I'm going to listen to that. Whether you, know, you don't have to. If I go to Google, what do I find under the private equity returns? What are the returns? Should I put in Google? Mid, what are the returns of private Yeah, so there's, like everything else, there's uh, private equity is a con, is a is an asset class. So it's like saying, what's the return of stocks? So S&P is 500. Uh, you know, so look at uh, Bain, which is where um, Milt Romney worked at, double-digit returns. Carlisle, double-digit returns. 
um, 15, 16, 17 net of expenses. Um, and they can buy things and turn them around. So they're, they're not just buying things and having the market go up to be worth more. They're buying things and they're making the value themselves. And that's the, that's the other element of thinking things differently. Hoping and holding may not get you the best returns over the next five or six years if things get choppy. But if you own something that is recession resistant, high dividend paying, or has a me mechanism where they're adding value. So storage is another place. If you take an empty lot and own, put storage on there, you just added value. Now, you have to be putting it, putting it in the right place, um, and it has to be, you can't be paying crazy amounts of money for the land, because then you're never gonna rent the storage for enough of it. That's a good, good point though. Yeah, so there's no right answer to how we're doing it. I'm just looking at the, the dashboard that we're seeing. Um, the other thing I wanna share with you, Google City National Rockdale Speedometers. So City National, all one word. Rockdale's R-O-C-H-D-A-L-E. And you're gonna thank me for this. City National Rockdale Speedometers. It is exactly what you think it is. It is 12 speedometers green, yellow, or red. Green is good, yellow is not so good, red is not good at all. You don't have to do anything other than look at the speedometers. The speedometers are about 16 years old. They go back 16 years. So you can see historically what the speedometers changed going into 2008. You can see the, the you know, and it's a speedometer. So you can see the, you know, the, 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 the needle move. And it goes from green to yellow to red. Six months ago, there was never as many green as there was. Um, now, I would say of the nine green, six are yellow. In six months, and now what was red was a political turmoil. Like they just say, here's what it is, and they have no skin in the game. This is just what their research is showing, and all they do, and, and they have someone assigned to each speedometer, and it'll say equity valuation. It'll say, you know, um, interest rate risk. It'll, I mean, it's all there. But it's simple, and all you have to do is not be <clears throat> colorblind. You don't have to understand the words. If things are green, things are you can you know be very comfortable in the S and P 500. When things are starting to go yellow, you just have to think a little bit more before your money. If things are going red, you might not want to add more money to it. Um, and and so if you look at that, it's out there. It's public. Again, you don't have to log in. Um, I check them every month, and and because they have a track record, you can play with it. Oh, what did it look like six months before? 2008 really hit the fan, and you can see it. And, and it, it's there, and it's public. So City National Rockdale will let you know what's going on in the big picture, and none of those speedometers do any of us have any control over. But it's nice to know whether something's green, yellow, or red. Um, the reds, there's only two reds, and there's been two reds most of the last decade. Um, it's the greens going into yellow that is starting, you know, green going into yellow, Warren Buffett sitting on more cast than he ever had. I mean, there's a lot of signs out there that debt jubilee conversation we had. There's a lot of stuff out there that says to me, double check before you, you know, throw money into it. Um, and my kids are eight years old, so even if there is a correction, they're going to be fine because you know whatever they're in, as long as the company doesn't go bankrupt, but mutual funds can't go bankrupt because there's so many things inside them. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Any other? Yes, yeah, shooter. <clears throat> Two things. One is um, talk to one guy. And he he gave. I can't remember where it is. I wish I could. I have his stuff at home. But it was an investor that he suggested that they they follow the S and P, and when that stock starts to dip, what they do is they come out of the more risky and they put it into the more stable, yep. risk averse, mm -hmm. and, the, and and they stay ahead of the. Um, it's pretty. I think it's like I forget what the um, what the fee is, but it's not it's not low. No. They showed me a chart. Of course, I don't know whether they ever believe these things when I'm showing them or not. Where net the fee, you're still pretty far ahead of the. Um, Yep. So there's uh, tactical tactical investing, which is yeah, looking at trends and where things are going. I did tactical in 2015, because even then I was concerned, well, maybe this is going to be, you know, the correction's coming. Um, and for that strategy, we were down double digits when the S&P was up double digits. Because the problem with that strategy is if, it, is if it's, if there's no trend, you're getting in and getting right back out and getting in and getting right back out. So you'd have a good month. And if you remember 2015 into 2016, there was markets up 800 points, markets down 500 points, markets up 400 points. It was a up and down and up and down. And all they did was keep missing the boat 
because no one was thinking, because the thing with tactical is it's all computer driven. The trends show sell, we're going to sell. Trends show buy, we're going to buy. None of it had anyone with their, you know, let's just wait. Let's stay invested for an extra month and see if, if the trends are true. Um, they have worked. They have worked. If the market's going to be choppy, they won't work as well, and they definitely won't work as advertised. I, I probably lost two clients from that because I'm supposed to know everything. Like we, we did it for the right reasons. They say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. It was a that let's stay in the market, and if it gets frothy, you know their system will tell them what to do. Um, we've never done another tactical because I think what will happen is once things start to happen, it'll it'll. It'll be faster than anyone's experienced. Because you think in 2008, it's kind of like if you were at a party and it got busted by the cops. You're not a new party. It's 2008, 19. You're listening for the cops. You're listening for the doors. You're making, you know. So if you hear, you're running for the door. You're running for the window. And there's too many people at the party to get out. And that's that's where things, you know, that's where bad things happen. Yeah, in the yeah I mean, it, 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 you know, for a little bit of money, you can't, it, you know. Five ten percent of a portfolio price is not going to hurt to have something because in my case that would be an alternative strategy, I'm not just being I'm in the market. Speaking of a small, yeah. small percent, maybe twenty percent. Maybe that's yeah, if you can get in, if you can get in lower than that to see if it works. Yeah, I was thinking of testing it because you know they, they never show you the what you just talked about. And then the other, I think it's the same kind of thing, but in, in Vanguard they have, um, and, and my employers, my former employers plan, which I'm still eligible to stay in. They they do a um, what they call managed engine, yep. and again that's worked pretty well and, and, and it's a it's a similar thing to what I just described but I don't think it's as um, uh, you know hurry up here oh too late hurry up there right. oh, too late it's probably more of a of a, of a trend um, that's not instant or tactical all of the systems that you're seeing now so all the robo advisors that you hear about Wealthfront uh, these are computer driven. None of them were even, the kids probably weren't even, you know, investing age that built this stuff. Um, no robo-advising platform or managed platform that's been in the last 15 years developed, which the good ones are the ones that just got developed, have seen a, a bear market. They haven't seen a market. And, and one thing, again, a bull market, a bull's going to use his horns and lift you up. So a bull market's an up market, a bear's going to swap you down. So if you, you know, why would I call it a bear market? The bear market's going to swap you down. So the things that people are using today have been back tested, but haven't been around to even survive. You know, so we don't know how they're really going to work. Um, it'll be interesting to see because supposedly every financial advisor's job is going to be replaced by the robo advisor. I don't think that's going to happen. And it might happen for the asset allocation. You don't need me to tell you to do 60/40. You need me or people like me to say, okay, here's the stuff that they're not going to have at Vanguard, or they're not. And, and the, the accreditation thought process of, okay, are you accredited? Can you have access to it? Is it appropriate? And let's do 5, 10, 20% in these other strategies that, because we're never going to, and that's the other part that I want to share, that 70% of Harvard and Yale that are in those alternatives, it's not all private equity, it's all things that are not public markets. You as a individual, not a foundation, are limited to 25%. So even if you are accredited, you have a million dollars in the market, only 250 can go in that, that that category, which is okay. I mean, I'm not saying it's good or bad, but you will never get to be 70%. So you'll never, an individual will never have the returns that a Harvard and Yale can. It's not fair, but that's the so, way the rules so are. So that managed money algorithm that some of these have, like the Vanguard, for example, we, we have no idea. They've never been tested. And neither do. They'll be back tested, but we don't know how the algorithm will handle it today. So it's not a bad thing. It's just, you, you know, they don't leave, that's not their first bullet point on the brochure is, hey, we've never seen this in real life. We built it, you know, five, six years ago, and we haven't had a down, down market in 18 years. We think it'll work, but they can't say that it would. So the, the rule of thumb is, you know, you don't put all your eggs in one basket. That's a perfect example. It probably still might be better than putting it into uh, an index fund and hoping, because at least there's some, you know, whether you consider that value add, like we talked about, but at least there's some thought behind what they're buying and what they're selling. Good question. Any other questions? So you got the website. Um, if you want the risk questionnaire, let Mark know and we'll let me know and I'll give you the, the link. The link is individual to each of you so that no one else sees your number. Um, 
Any questions, let me know. Again, you reach me on here. I'm a local guy, so you'll probably see me around. And that is it. Right. Only an hour and a half.